The Dutch East India Company, founded in 1602, was a major trading partner serving Asia. The porcelain china with blue motifs became extremely popular with affluent families as well as the royalty of the Netherlands. Guests can experience combination tours of this historic city as well as the inner workings of the production and history of Delft Blue. We were established in the city centre of Delft uh, in 1653 uh, and that by a certain time we had about 20 different locations in the city centre of Delft and uh, that wasn't very uh, practical to produce Delft Blue. So that's why we moved to this location here. It was bigger, we could centralise the whole production. Most of our painters are upstairs, um, but there's always one or two painters demonstrating, obviously, because that's what people come to see. Uh, the painters get an education within the company. It's about eight to ten years before you can become, you, before you are a fully skilled royal delta painter. You also see the secret of Delft Blue. It's painted in black. It should actually be called Delft Black. Um, and when it's fired in the kiln, when it's fired in the oven, it transforms into blue. It's a black paint with cobalt oxide, which undergoes a chemical reaction when it's fired at a very high temperature, which is about 1150, 1200 degrees. Adding... So that's cobalt oxide that she's using? Yes. Okay. Yes, and adding water, creates the different hues of blue. So if you add more uh, water, okay. you get a lighter shade, uh, less water gives you a darker shade. And the re one of the reasons that the training is so long, eight to 10 years, is to do with getting a feeling for how much water you need to add to get the right shades. Um, the painters always have a model uh, quite often in front of them with the original product, which we photograph for their catalog and for our website, for example. And, um, they, uh, that's what they use to see where the shades, what type of shades they use. And pinholes in it. These are hand, handmade by our painters as well. And this is what we put on. This one's for a vase, for example. It's put on a vase. You stamp over it with a charcoal. And what, then the result is, you can't see it very well here, but you see the outlines of a decoration. And those are used to create the decoration. So this is the decoration that then the painter paints. It's just for the outlines, it's to, to give the painter guidelines. We've been creating some pieces since 1653. Uh, this means that it's hand painted by a Royal Delft painter here in Delft. If a product doesn't have this on it, it's not from Royal Delft. It's a small bottle at the top. Our Dutch name is uh, the porcelain fles, and fles in Dutch is a bottle. So that's the bottle, a J and a T stand for Joost Toft. Joost Toft bought the country, uh, well, the company, at the end of the 19th century uh, to revive Delft Blue. That's the period when Germany and England were making a better product, and he wanted to make sure that Delft Blue wasn't lost. So he bought the company with the intention to revive it. He went to England, he went to Germany, he studied the production methods, he studied the decoration techniques, came back to Delft and um, made all types of improvements to the paint, to the clay, to the production. Uh, and uh, quite quickly after that, within about five years, we were winning prizes for our Delft Blue. Mm -hmm. Delft Blue was a real status product. It was uh, quite expensive and it was used on top of mantelpieces uh, to, sh to, to, to show off. Sometimes also it was uh, used along the bottom of a floor. Mm -hmm. And that was a very practical use for the tiles, because when, you were, when the maid was scrubbing the house, she wouldn't touch the walls. Mm. Nowadays, we're, we're noticing a true revival in Delft Blue. When I started seven years ago, it wasn't a particularly popular product. It was a bit like grandma had it in her attic, yeah. and, and nobody was that interested. Nowadays, you see a lot of modern designers coming back to Delft Blue and interpreting it in their own way. This is the biggest piece in our... Uh, collection in our standard collection. It's one meter and 20 centimeters and it consists of different levels which means you can put water in each level and stick a flower in. 
This is that we make to commemorate various royal occasions. These are birth plates, but we also have them for royal marriages, coronations. Mm -hmm. We always have a piece of orange in them because the Dutch royal family surname is Van Oranje, from Orange. Um, the orange is painted in orange. It does undergo the same chemical reaction as the black to the blue. And these are always limited editions. So we make a maximum of 100 following the uh, occasion that we made it for. The first is a gift to the Dutch royal family. Then there's one for our collection, Delft White. Um, that meant that we were one of the only companies that kept all their employees until almost the end of the Second World War. Uh, so we could keep everybody employed and that was very important to the company. Uh, this turned out to be, even though it was an emergency collection, turned out to be one of the most uh, popular collections that we made. It took them almost a year to paint. One painter started left, one painter started right, and they worked towards each other. And the reason is she was inspired by Mary Stuart II. And Mary Stuart II was married to Willem III. Mary Stuart was an English woman. Willem III was a Dutch uh, stadtholder, he was called then. And Mary Stuart II uh, loved Chinese porcelain and loved Delft blue. And she was actually the reason that Delft blue became so popular in the 17th century. All of her palaces, uh, Hampton Court, Palais at Lower the Netherlands, they had uh, palaces all over and they were all filled with Delft blue. So she was kind of the influencer of, uh, of the Dutch Golden Age. And when we were thinking about a new product, um, we wanted to bring the pride back into Delft Blue. We wanted people to be proud of owning it again. And she was proud of having this beautiful collection of Delft Blue. So that's why uh, she got the name Proud Mary. She's a collector's item. They consist of four different elements. You can see them there. It's a skirt, uh, a body, a collar, and then uh, the face. Uh, and true to Mary Stuart II, you can collect them. You can combine your own styles and uh, you know, we hope that she'll become the collector's item of the 21st century. So this is uh, quite probably the most quiet factory in the 21st century. Uh, that's to do with the fact that we make everything by hand, so we don't need any machines. The radio makes the most uh, noise in this factory and for the rest of Apart from that, everything is done by hand. We work with plaster moulds. Our plaster moulds are also made by hand by a mould maker who we employ here. And uh, into the pl plaster mould, that's what happens here. We uh, pour a liquid clay. Because the mould is made of plaster, it extracts the water from the clay and a thin crust will appear in the mould. You'll see that happen in a minute and I can show you. That will, that will make it visual, that helps. Um, once that happens, we pour the remaining clay back into the jug and you just let it dry. And what you then get is, uh, I can show you, the dried clay. It's too big now, it's grown. Um, dried clay. Nothing else has happened than this has been left to dry. But you can see that, so I can break it. But it also wasn't smooth, so these are quite rough products. If they went into the kiln now straight away, uh, you would get that it would turn very hard and it wouldn't be a pretty product. So the smoothing off, what happens at those stations is done before it goes into the kiln. It goes into the kiln for the first time. We have three large ones two smaller kilns and the kiln is uh, heated up to 1150 degrees and cooled back down during 24 hours and then when it comes out the product that we are left with is once fired clay. This is what we call the biscuit. The biscuit then goes to the painters. It gets a layer of glaze sprayed over it 
goes back into the oven. The uh, oven is heated up to 1200 degrees and cooled back down during 24 hours. The black has turned blue in the kiln and that's where you have your final product. A lot of things can go wrong in actually every step of this process because it's all done by hand. So for example, if you let the clay stay too long in the mold, the crust will get too thick and you get a very thick product, which isn't what we want. We want a certain thickness of a product. Anything can go wrong. Uh, it's a spray glaze that we apply. So the product is twisted round whilst the spray glaze is sprayed at the product. If it's sprayed at a certain point too long, the glaze can get too thick at a certain point. And you see that in the final product. Delft Blue offers a variety of packages that include exquisite coffee hour, lunches, dinners, painting classes, or a glorious high tea at Brasserie 1653. The treats of high tea are made in accordance with recorded recipes from the 17th century, which include the spices characteristic of a time when they were imported by the Dutch East India Company. Uh, at the bottom there are the uh, warm uh, snacks. These ones are cinnamon scones. And you're supposed to eat them with the clotted cream and uh, this is lemon curd and uh, jam. Uh, these ones are quiche Lorraine. This one is apple liver biscuits. These are dates with bacon. Uh, also warm. Uh, sandwiches with old cheese. And, then at the top, these ones are ginger cookies. These two are skokkermops, so I can't really translate that. These two are spekkoek, so that's also difficult to translate. Um, this is carrot cake, this is bread pudding. <laughs>